I've got four cameras with me, a whole bunch of batteries, the tapes I need, the camera gear I need associated with that stuff. And other than that, I've got the ocean. This time on Survivor Man, I'm heading to Central America and the country of Belize, a tropical paradise of the highest order. But for this challenge, I won't be anywhere near land. I'm heading out into the open ocean. Like a castaway, I'm going to be set adrift in a life raft, left to the mercy of the wind and the currents. For seven days, I'll be lost at sea without food or fresh water, only the searing tropical sun above me and the depths of the ocean below me. My support crew and I are going to head way out into the open water where they'll set me adrift. But before we left, I tested out what I thought would be the raft we would be using. Life rafts are packed by the manufacturer and have an expiration date printed on the case. We found this one on a local yacht. And even though it was six months past its due date for repacking, it was considered by the yacht's owner to be ready for use. Within only two minutes of a promising start, the plugs on the raft completely failed and it deflated. What if this had been a real emergency? Anyone attempting to use this raft would have been dead in the water. My support crew has found a replacement raft, but there's no time to test it out. I have flown, biked, driven, paddled and helicoptered into survival locations, but somehow sailing to where I must spend the next seven days surviving alone has a much more powerful feel to it, more final. Gord Lacko, my marine survival expert, and Frank Gagliano, my boat captain, tried to figure out the best place to drop me so they could follow my drift from afar. They think that I can drift in the wind and current to a group of small islands, and if all goes right, I may be able to beach myself on one towards the end of the week. Just getting ready to toss this raft over, we're going to first disable the hydrostatic release. This uh, gadget here operates like a depth charge fuse. If this yacht sank, with no one ready to uh, release it. At about 10 feet underwater, this would blow, release this hook, which flies back, the raft comes up. But the way we're launching it, we're going to chuck it overboard, so we'll do it manually. Sometimes, if the vessel is sinking fast, the raft can inflate and get caught up in the rigging and be taken to the bottom of the ocean with the boat. These rafts can be very heavy, and I don't know how anyone is expected to lift one by themselves while their boat is sinking and a storm is blowing. It's been quite a problem for many people throughout history. But the sailor's rule of thumb for life rafts is that you should only use it when you actually have to step up to climb in. The raft opens upside down, a common occurrence. Hopefully the few supplies it comes with haven't fallen out or been soaked by the salt water. In an emergency, a boat can take just seconds to sink. I can't imagine how hard it must be to get into a raft like this in a heaving, stormy sea at night. On a quick check, it looks like the supplies haven't floated away, but they're all saturated with salt water. Hopefully the bailer is still here. You're gone! There goes Les. Now the crew leaves me to drift alone. They'll try to keep track of me throughout the week. My fears, dehydration, sunstroke, and sharks. This is it. This is it for real now. I'm sure the reality is going to sink in any minute now. I just got to take a moment just to figure out what it is I got to do. Well, actually I know what it is. The first thing I got to do 
Let's get all this water out of here. Get myself as dry as possible, as quickly as possible. It's a great raft, but it's already leaking badly through the floor, which means I'll be bailing constantly. Well, I'm completely alone now. The potential for something to go wrong is very high. There's great risk in doing this. I've got a shadow boat with me. Now, they can't chit-chat with me on the radio, but they've got to monitor my safety all week long. I'm quite nervous about it all. For now, the seas are relatively calm, but there's so much openness around me, so much water. It's easy to become overwhelmed by the immense ocean. Well, it's not hard to figure out what you do in a situation like this. I mean, you either want to try and attract attention by signaling somehow, or you want to hit land. Obviously, I'm not going to be trying to attract attention. What I'm going to hope for is that there are keys, little islands, basically, that uh, I might land on with this. And I can try to make that happen by playing with the sea anchor, like a parachute on a long line sent out. And it helps to keep the raft stable and keep it from flipping over because it pulls down and can slow your progress as well. So I might want to pull it up if I want to try and speed up and hit an island. All right, well, let's take a look at the construction of this raft. These rafts have got two separate tubes to keep the flotation happening, as well as a, an arch to give me my roof. They color it on the inside all blue because they believe that's a more calming color. And they also feel that it does help to stop uh, seasickness. Got a uh, zipper at the back of it to help air go through, and also a rain catch. It's not attached right now, but this is the water bladder. This little tube attaches to the rain catch. You know, just about every shipwreck survivor, anybody had to spend time at sea in a life raft, complain about constant air leaks or constant water leaks from the bottom of their raft. Just so happens, I've got both. make this work and film it too is to tie on a little rubber dinghy to go with me. It'll be a place where I can put most of my camera gear. Wind has died right down and the sun is going down. Soon it'll be dusk, which has the horrible nickname of the sharking hour. Sharks get much more active at dusk than at dawn. when they're feeding. I think what I'm gonna to have to do for the night is climb into the little blue dinghy, spend the night in there dry. Survivors often have both a life raft and a dinghy as an emergency backup. There's so much water in my raft that I'm going to sleep in the open dinghy to try to stay dry. That's mostly home. I guess this is the bedroom. I don't think I could be up in here in the heat of the day. I'd just be scorched by that sun. But right now, the sun lost its strength and it's going down. It's nice to get in here and get dry. I feel like I'm a lot lower to the water. It feels a lot more vulnerable. I feel a lot more vulnerable. Pretty hard, I think, no matter who you are, to not be in a situation like this and just be thinking about sharks constantly. I don't care how tough you are, man. This is not a, an easygoing situation. I 
I've slept in deserts, jungles, swamps, the Arctic, tops of mountains, but out here in the middle of the ocean like this is by far the eeriest it's ever felt. There's not much between me and the ocean. A little bit of rubber. That's about it. It's day two of my seven days lost at sea. There's only a few square feet of rubber raft protecting me from the perils and the depths of the ocean. Let me do a spin around and show you what I can see. That's it. <sighs> before it gets too windy and too wavy out here, and before that sun gets too high and intense, it's already getting pretty warm. Maybe what I'll do is I'll show you what I have for supplies. Now, in this situation, I wanted to go with the supplies that came with the raft and find out what we got. Something really interesting happened. When the raft opened up upside down, the water got into everything. I mean, and you see, it's surprising how, how, I don't know, unwaterproof uh, the stuff was. This is the actual bag, which is not a waterproof bag. The top was just open. Okay, now this is something that I have myself. This didn't come with the kit. Emergency navigation chart. I may be able to use it for uh, figuring out where I am. Okay, these are three hand flares and once again water got into them and I could feel they, them reacting with the water. They were getting hot, internally hot. Waterproof flashlight. It doesn't work. Okay, first aid kit. I have added multi-tool. I brought a pair of goggles, I'll tell you why. With a pair of goggles, you might be able to dive for some fish or some conch shells or something like that. We've got the blue dinghy and the raft. All right, I'm going to pull up the sea anchor, the drogue, because uh, it would be nice if I could slip behind some of the small islands that I'm passing. And if I pull up the drogue, it'll lessen the drag in the water and help me to move a little faster, possibly into a better position than I am right now, because I'm pretty exposed out here. It can go either way. Drifting at a couple of knots, I could easily travel as far as 50 miles a day. On the other hand, without wind or strong current, I could bob around like a cork in one place, frying under the relentless tropical sun. So here I am, set adrift in a very, very big ocean. Sorry, it's hard to talk. I have to. Uh, I have to keep looking at the horizon so I don't start to feel too seasick. It's been hours, and my safety boat is nowhere to be seen. All right, you want to see the cold hard reality of this? Susan calling talisman. Susan calling talisman. Susan is the name of the raft, by the way. No answer. This is our high-powered VHF. Susan calling talisman. Susan calling talisman. No answer.
which means that at this very moment, anything could go wrong to me here, right here and now, and they wouldn't be able to hear my cries for help. This is the boat down here. Les is somewhere out in here. We're not quite sure where. I do not read you anymore, uh, Talisman. I do not read you anymore. Over. Talisman, this is Susan. I read you loud and clear. Over. Finally, after hours of no visual in this thick haze, the safety boat does a pass by to check and see if I'm still alive. Waves are calming down. And I guess night is coming in. The raft has bad leaks both in the floor and the air chambers, causing me to bail and reinflate every 20 minutes. I'll need to climb into the blue dinghy that is my camera platform. The raft is leaking. It's like just sitting in a big warm bathtub. Climbed into the dinghy. So I can get up and get dry in the dinghy. It really is going to be a long, long night. My life jacket is on in case I roll out of the dinghy in my sleep. Then, without warning, a sudden rain squall hits. Okay, well... I finally, I just climbed in here. I'm soaking wet now, of course. Finally, as I get myself organized, get the camera turned on, it stops raining. But good news is it rained enough that I got some fresh water caught in the rain catch. It's probably going to be salty a bit, but mostly of it, most of it is fresh water. Actually, no, hardly any salt water in it at all. It doesn't taste very good though, coming off the plastic. Oh, that's nice. Nice to get the fresh water though. Survivor Man has gone six miles from the place he was dumped into the sea, but he probably covered 20 miles uh, throughout the night, going in circles, unfortunately. So that's got to be the maddening part of it. For a while, you see a light or you see a piece of land, and then it starts to disappear. It's really hard to tell, but when you look at the islands, I have a feeling that I drifted one way in the night and maybe even drifted back out again because the breeze has changed. There's one sort of big island I can see and the breeze has changed. It's now blowing me away from that, that island. I interchange keys and islands. Down here they call them keys or islands. It really doesn't matter. I've 
I've got little fish that have decided to make the bottom side of my raft home. That could be good. Well, good in that I might be able to make a meal of them, bad in that they are a floating meal for larger fish and eventually sharks. So at this point, as my captain so eloquently put it, I am now part of the food chain. Dolphin just swam through within just feet of me, no doubt checking me out. That was cool. I'm glad to see him so close to me. I mean, he passed by within feet. A dolphin is a good sign. They have been known to even protect swimmers from massive great white sharks. You know, a lone survivor is at a grave, grave disadvantage. There's no one to help. There's no one to tease me out of fear. There's no one that I could even be brave, courageous for. No one to talk to. Except maybe this fly. It is just dead still. You know, I didn't even know it could get like this out in the ocean. But it's dead still. Nothing's moving. There's no wind, no air. Sun's beating down. I don't, I'm not moving anywhere. This is getting steamy and dangerously hot. I may be in the middle of a vast ocean, but this heat and the thick haze have conspired to make me feel very claustrophobic. While I battle heat stroke, my whole world consists of these two pieces of inflated rubber. It's very hazy. But you can still get burned badly through this kind of cloud cover. Well, in this heat, finally a slight breeze has just picked up. What I want to do is maybe uh, chart my speed of my drift now. I can actually figure out my drift speed with a rope of determined length and something small to float past it. Here's my measurement marker. I got a little bit of tissue paper. This is my very crude version of the 17th century naval instrument called a log line. Eight. Six thousand. Seven thousand. Eight thousand. Nine thousand. At the halfway mark, I stopped counting at 32. 32 halfway, so all the way would have been 64. So let's, uh, let's, so, a quick bit of mathematical chart checking, and I can determine my speed. Hmm. Well, that's hard to tell. So I'm probably roughly traveling somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3 knots. Not very fast. A very slow lumbering unit here. It's traveling much faster when they first drop me in the water, and slow ever since. We have a big thunderstorm coming in, and they've just come back into radio contact with me, and they're suggesting that this could be a big one, and that they could actually lose me in the storm. Well, I've 
got a very, very eerie problem happening here. Uh, the water has becalmed again, and I'm just sitting in a very still bit of water. I'm back into the dinghy now to try and sleep out the night, but I'm seeing all kinds of wicked heat lightning. And uh, I know that uh, it's possible that at some point in this night, a storm could come upon me and really buck it down. Sitting here in calm water, no wind, waiting for a big storm to come down on you, watching it come down the way. Cross your fingers I don't get hit by it tonight. Here comes the rain. It's really coming down out there. I'm just blowing like crazy. The zipper wasn't busted, I wouldn't be getting poured on. But I am getting poured on. This is pretty intense. All right, this is getting dangerous now. I put on my strobe flasher, and I think the crew is going to come out and tether me to their boat. The winds have picked up, and it's storming, the rain is bucketing down, and there's a good chance they could lose me tonight if they don't come and tether me. This is pretty scary. This is one of those, better come and get me now, or they could lose me forever. The tropical storm is wild and getting stronger, and it seems intent on blowing me all the way to Honduras. The safety boat has to move in quickly once it spots my emergency strobe light. Then it, too, has to escape the massive waves and wind by ducking into a small lagoon before it is wrecked on a reef somewhere. Less felt the uh, whole blast of that squall that just came through, and it could have driven us apart and made it almost impossible to find him. I'm now tethered to the safety boat. For the safety of the crew as well, it pulls into the lee of an island to wait out the storm. In the morning, I briefly jump aboard the boat so they can reposition my raft out into the open water. It's a welcomed respite, but then it's back into the raft. Got me loose. Excuse me, guys. The next day dawns fairly clear, and Gord and Frank decide that it's finally safe to set me adrift again. One of the biggest challenges of survival at sea is psychological. The monotony and desperation of week after week of drift and waves can break the will to live. Survivors tell heartbreaking stories of ships passing close by, only to disappear over the horizon. The promise of land, even deserted, must be a godsend for the true survivor. All week, islands have passed by tantalizingly close, but impossible for me to get to. This island is within reach. All right, you see that? Now I'm drifting in a way. With any luck, I'll hit this little island. If I don't hit it, I'm way out and beyond the reef. It looks like it's going to be tight whether I hit it or not. The current's doing one thing, the wind's doing another. I'll show you where I am. Like this. Directly underneath the raft is a field of skin ripping, bone jarring, and sometimes poisonous coral. This is not really the safest thing here. That coral is going to be sharp. This is more dangerous than it may look. Coral reefs can rip apart yachts or simply shred the skin from my legs. I thought about jumping in to pull the raft to shore, but I get lucky 
and I hit a sandy cove instead. After days of bobbing around on the ocean, the solid ground feels amazing. The irony is that being cast away on a small island is in some ways worse off than being adrift at sea. At least then I was going somewhere in the raft. Now I'm trapped on a tiny island, and my safety crew has left for the mainland, leaving me utterly alone once again. It's a pretty small island. I don't know, maybe 90 yards long by 75 yards wide. Wow. People have been here and cleared out this area here for shelter. I'm gonna shelter here too. In this case, the evidence of people can only mean poachers. They come from other countries and use these desolate ocean islands to poach lobster. Their garbage, along with trash from shipwrecks, is all over the island. This raft that confidently held my life for days is now relegated to keeping scorpions and crabs off of me at night. Now, I do have one serious problem. The possibility of heat stroke. I'm feeling extremely hot. I'm still sweating, that's a good sign. But uh, I gotta be really careful if I get to the point where I'm not sweating. That's very dangerous. I gotta go cool down. It's been a long time without food, and the rain that filled both the raft and the blue dinghy was tainted with seawater. I went in to cool off there just now. I'm standing there. I look down. About a three and a half foot shark swam right by me. I tell you, I'm glad to be out of that raft. Like you would not believe. So tomorrow, it's all about food and water. There's no water on this island to speak of in terms of springs, so I'm gonna have to find other methods. And try for some live food. Very bright moon tonight. It's making it so that I can walk around on the island without too much problem in the dark. Well, it is certainly the strangest feeling to be inside this life raft and not be jostled back and forth constantly. Time to get some sleep. Good night. There are some big cockroaches around here. That uh, was one horrible sleep. I still have what they call stillness illness. Once you're on the solid ground, feels like everything's still moving. Even this morning, it still feels like the raft is, is, is bobbing around.
Here's what's left of my rain catchment bag. You know what I could do, especially with a bag like this and the long tube that comes with it? A water enema, basically. You can't do it with seawater because it'll kill you. But brackish, slightly brackish water or slightly tainted water, there was one family kept themselves alive by giving themselves daily enemas with tainted water that they couldn't otherwise drink or it would make them sick. Fortunately, there are palm trees on this island. All over this island, there are parts and supplies from boats, refuse from ships, as well as the leftovers from the poachers. Cold hard reality of just about everywhere on the planet. You can always find garbage of some sort. This is one half of the canister that the life raft came in. The idea is that all the seawater and all the greenery will start to evaporate. The seawater will evaporate and the green will, greenery will sweat, the moisture out of it will evaporate, hit the plastic on the roof, and then hopefully little droplets will drip down, 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 down to the lowest point which is right up above my little catch cup. Drinking only the liquid of green coconuts can lead to diarrhea. I need some solid food, and the best place for that is the ocean. in there all right. This is a conch shell and inside is a delectable treat. There's no way that I can pull him out of there and the shell is extremely hard but it does have just one one weak spot. Did it. Well it won't be conch chowder but after five days without food it should hit the spot. There we go. I'm basically going to cut away everything that isn't white. All right now. First of all, this little piece here. It's all about the strength of the conch. And here's what I want. Fresh white meat from right out of the conch. Just eat raw. And if I found one, I'm sure I can find more. Smells fresh. warm, but it's fresh water. Who'd have thought? It's 
clean house, but it's better than nothing. So the solar still does work. It just takes its time. That's good. I think I slept better when the bottom of this raft wasn't rock hard. Uh, at least it didn't rain last night. Cool. Sea snails. They're locally known as willocks. Gathered a bunch of coconut husks from the island. We've also got bamboo. This may be my easiest fire starting <sighs> challenge yet. This is one of my hand flares. Okay, that works. Yep. Okay. Flares died. Cockroaches are all going running. I've got the Willocks in there in uh, seawater. Gonna cook them up. Get rid of all the entrails. Mm, a little overdone. Rubbery, but good. The next few days can be spent gathering sea snails, coconuts, and conch shells. I've found an old bottle. There is one thing I could do with it. It may seem like a cliche, but survivors adrift, even in recent years, have used bottles to send messages. Notes have been scratched on styrofoam or anything else that will float. I can only imagine the desperate feeling of knowing that your only chance for rescue may lie in a small bottle floating out to sea. Adrift at sea was an experience I approached with trepidation. For my time out here, I was just a speck on the ocean. In a storm, even a rescue boat can be powerless against the forces of nature. Before the end of day six, the world's realities take over. Belize is now in a state of political turmoil. So the crew comes back to free me from my island prison. Oh, and the note in the bottle? It has my phone number on it. I'm still waiting for someone to call. <laughs> 